in the whole of New England, there exists 245,608 miles of road. Highways make up 1,579 miles of this. However, it is just a few miles of unassuming interstate through the rural hills of the region that are responsible for such an inordinate amount of deaths that, if all of the victims, if combined, would rival the population of many of the picturesque little towns that populate the surrounding landscape. Locally, this plain stretch of straight, four-lane, blacktop and short, curving off ramps is known as the sleeping exits. Though none of the local publications have picked up on the moniker, likely believing it to be poor taste. There isn't anything special about this short section of highway at all. In fact, it's quite ordinary. Nothing about it jumps out to even the most observant of operators that would suggest an unusual amount of danger at hand. No abnormally sharp turns, no odd or irregular road configurations, no bottlenecks, and almost no traffic to speak. The highway rides straight as an arrow and flat as a cult stone slab through the rolling hills and pine forests. The locals refer to them as the sleeping exits for their seemingly uncanny ability to lull a driver to sleep as if by some unseen hypnotic power. The vast majority of the accidents happen at night and have mostly been attributed by the local police to drivers nodding off at the wheel. There are the occasional drunk drivers and careless accidents, but those seem to be the exception and not the rule. The majority of fatalities appear to be drivers that gently drifted off to sleep, never to awaken again. Just last year, a tractor trailer truck went off the highway at 3am, plowing through a drainage ditch and a pair of chain link fences before jackknifing flipping on its side and coming to rest only feet in front of a gas station across the street. The driver was killed after being pinned under the wreck for over an hour. An autopsy revealed no alcohol or drugs of any kind in the man's system. There were no other vehicles present on the scene and there were no skid marks from braking or otherwise until after the truck had jackknifed. The only witness to the crash was the clerk at the gas station who said he just saw the truck drive straight off the road for no apparent reason. A few months after that, at around midnight, a family of five that was on their way back to New York from a leaf peeping trip drove through a quadrail and head on into a concrete overpass support at nearly 70 miles an hour. Everyone in the car was listed as DOA at the local ER. Once again, no drugs or alcohol were found in the driver's system, and the accident was only reported by a highway patrolman who happened upon the crash some minutes later. There were also no skid marks or any other signs of breaking by the driver. They just drove right off the road to their deaths. These are just a few of the more grisly examples of the exit victims, though there are countless more to be found by anyone willing to do their research, and they all seem to fit, more or less, the same description. A vehicle driving late at night, seemingly without provocation from any outside force, drives off the road with no sign of hard braking, fishtailing, or loss of control of any kind. The driver's body, when tested later, shows no signs of intoxication. The only logical explanation for the crashes being that the driver was asleep at the wheel. Personally, I've driven this very stretch of highway numerous times in my life and can bear some witness to its mysterious ability. There is a popular bar and music venue at one end of the exits that I frequented to watch local musicians play. I would drive up from my home, usually around 5 or 6pm, before darkness had fallen, and return late in the dead of the night. I had to pass directly through six exits that made up the dreadful length of highway. I'm sure there were side roads that went around it, but it was, without a doubt, the quickest way to my destination, and I'm not at all a superstitious person. I made this trip frequently through my mid-twenties without any problem. The road was flat, well paved and straight. There were no street lights and a small belt of forest on both sides and in the median made it almost feel as if you were passing through a tunnel. It was relaxing and calming and required very little attention to navigate, but that was it. In all my trips through the exit, I never had any trouble keeping my eyes open or felt any mysterious pull to slumber. Sure. It seemed that a truly exhausted driver would be more likely to nod off in this section, but that alone didn't seem to account for the sheer volume of strange and violent wrecks that took place there. I figured there was some reasonable explanation to it, if one were to look close enough. 
Maybe the numbers were inflated somehow. Maybe this route happened to be a convenient one for those making very long drives through the region. Maybe an ancient native burial ground was entombed underneath. Maybe it was aliens. Honestly, I never gave it much thought. I just chalked it all the hype up to a combination of superstition and bad drivers. But all that came to an end after one horrifying drive years ago. On a dark autumn night towards the end of my twenties, I took the ride out to the local venue up past the exits to see my friends band play and have a few drinks. Darkness was falling early this time of year so it was barely light when I passed through the cursed area on my ride out. Somewhere, deep inside myself, I felt relieved to be past them before nightfall. I chuckled out loud at how silly I was being. The ride was beautiful and scenic, as always, and the sunset was a spectacular blood red, which seems to forebode an exciting and eventful evening ahead. I brushed off my childish nerves and enjoyed the rest of my ride, quietly anticipating the festivities to come. As I expected, the night was rowdy and full of youthful revelry. Music was played loud. Drinks and other chemical indulgences were enjoyed in abundance. Singing and dancing were the status quo. Stories and jokes were told loudly. Romances started, then ended, and then started again anew. Couples disappeared for minutes on end and reappeared, ruddy-faced and smirking. Laughter echoed off the walls and out into the street. The atmosphere felt alive with a certain electricity that seemed not altogether wholesome. But honestly, how else did we really want it? We were young and being bad was still a good thing. We knew someday it would have to end, but why should that be tonight? Around 1am, the bartender gave the last call for drinks. As per my usual ritual, I grabbed a shot of espresso and a glass of water for the ride home and quickly drank them both down. I said my goodbyes, shook hands, traded hugs and even a few flirtatious looks. Then I was on my way. I didn't like to linger. Besides, the night was dark, crisp, exceedingly beautiful and cast in the light of what appeared to be a full moon. I was looking forward to the drive home. I rolled my window down to let the night in. I put the car in drive and pulled away into the dark, headlights illuminating the way. Before long, I was back on the highway and nearing the sleeping exits. The once beautiful night had now dimmed considerably, both literally and metaphorically. The moon was now hidden behind a cloud and a heavy, stagnant mist had settled down over the surface of the road. On top of this, the jitters from the ride up had returned and, once again, the atmosphere began to come alive with an unwholesome energy. This time though, the fun was gone from it. I pushed the anxiety to the back of my mind, blaming it partially on the joint I'd shared earlier with some friends, and focused on the road. I wanted to speed up to get past the exits, but the thick fog made that altogether too dangerous. I passed the exit sign that marked the entrance to the forsaken section of interstate. There were five more exits to pass before I was out. Again, I pushed away the anxiety and tried to focus on the road. Watching the white dotted lines between the lanes flicker by light dying neon lights. Little clouds of fog bounced off my windscreen like dust of smoke. I pressed down on the gas pedal in spite of the visibility. I wanted out of there. I could feel the electricity in the atmosphere continuing to build. I passed the second exit. The atmosphere gained weight pressing down on me. I focused harder. Staring far off down the road into the oncoming darkness, trying to push all the thought from my mind. I pressed the pedal down harder, feeling the car picking up momentum. Images of crumpled vehicles and violent collisions flashed behind my eyes involuntarily. Though frightened terribly, I struggled to ignore them and pushed on. I passed the third exit. I took a deep breath. Then pushed it out. I did this again and again. It didn't help. I just needed to make it a little further. The sounds of a family screaming jumped into my head. The sounds of metal buckling and glass breaking followed. I forced them back down as I passed the fourth exit. The electricity in the air was no longer just a feeling anymore. It was a palpable, static per meeting the cabin. My hair stood on end as if attracted by an outside force. I felt it tingle down my spine and out through my limbs. I could feel my eyes watching me and unseen voices discussing my puny existence. I heard laughter in my head. I passed the fifth exit. The sixth and final exit was less than a mile away. I held desperately to the wheel with sweating hands and tried frantically to control my thoughts. I heard more voices joining the laughter. 
I bore my focus down on the last bit of road I needed to pass. I stepped harder on the pedal. The car accelerated. Then, the road began to glow. A cold, unnatural light shot out from every crevice on the roadway, white at first, and then tinted into a bluish purple with a deep, dull hum. A rumbling tremor shook through my car. I tried to hold the steer instead. The light grew in intensity until blinding. I took my hands from the wheel and held my arms in front of my face and round my eyelids shut. I groaned. There was a sound like an enormous pool of gasoline being lit. The light grew even brighter and a jolt of energy struck me like a hard kick to the chest. I was paralysed with shock. The car felt like it was floating through space. With a terrifying effort I forced my eyes open. The same bluish light hit me with the force of a cold dead sun. It was humming and pulsating with an overwhelming intensity. I was floating into it, spinning in circles. A throng of voices began murmuring wildly in my ears like a swarm of insects. I could make out one screaming for help. It cried my name. It cried with the fear and panic of a man being eaten alive by a predator. I saw blood. I felt death. Another voice chimed in crying wildly for help. I saw its broken bones. I felt its horrible pain. More joined. I cried out in anguish, clamping my hands to my ears and holding my eyes shut, so hard my face ached. Hundreds of voices were crying out now. Some were burning, others being torn apart by unseen things. Still, others crushed under incomprehensible weights. The din felt it like it would rupture my skull. My body was spinning out of control as if on the runway carnival ride. I thought I would vomit. I thought I was going to die. I screamed out in agony. I writhed in the pain of the unnumberable tortured souls. I screamed louder. I screamed until my throat was on fire and I tasted blood. Then, all of a sudden, I was back on the highway, barreling past the final exit at an alarming speed. The car was pointed off the road towards a 50 foot drop of an overpass. Instinctively, I jerked the wheel back to the left. The car began to slide on back top slick from the low fog. My man came back to me long enough to remember why I bought this particular car. The brand advertised a legendary all-wheel drive that had proven itself in the short time I'd been driving it to be more than mere hyperbole. With my final remaining bit of clarity, I steered into the slide and, as the front of the car came back around, I timed my moment and give the throttle the mercy's flick. The tyres bit into the road like a vice into a piece of plumbing. The little car held straight. I steered the wheel gently to the shoulder and gradually rolled to a stop. I sat, hyperventilating for what feels like eons. I sobbed into my hands, the full weight of what just transpired bearing down on me. I sobbed until my memory went blank. I don't recall how I got home after that. Needless to say, I don't drive through the exits anymore. I also don't take local legends for granted anymore either. The consequences are too dire. I've tried telling my story once or twice to my more open-minded friends. Well, they listen politely. I could tell they didn't believe me. So I've stopped telling it altogether. Hopefully, writing this down and sharing it here will help me process the events and, maybe, get over it, at least somewhat. I want the nightmares to end. I don't want to hear the screaming anymore. I don't want to feel the pain of all those poor souls. I want peace. I want to rest. So please, Listen to my words with an open mind. Try to at least take them seriously, however difficult that may be. And if ever you find yourself driving through an abnormally dark and level stretch of highway in rural New England, please take the back roads instead. It may just save your life. I lived in a fairly rural area. I worked an hour away from home. The drive never really bothered me though. It always gave me time to think about my day. In the morning, I had time to think about what I had to do. At night, I had time to unwind from being in work mode. Back then, I had just purchased my first home. I was 29, fresh out of college, and found a great job. Granted, I was in a great deal of debt. I had just graduated medical school with a speciality in infectious disease. None of that mattered though at the time. The debt I mean. I was a young doctor. I was proud, but undeniably naive. Everything seemed perfect. It was perfect. The hour each way to work was a small price to pay for what I had accomplished. 
There was hospitals that was more local, but it wasn't the kind of hospital that you'd willingly go to. Also, they didn't have a department for my speciality. It was a fairly easy route. I got on the highway, and it was basically a straight shot. By the end of my first week, I had the route completely memorised. For the first year, I was confident and full of pride. Things were good. Things were normal. About a year and some change into my new life, I noticed one morning on my way to work that the state was repaving the highway. They were only working on the oncoming side. The way I took on my way home, irritated, I looked up an alternative route on how to get home on my lunch break. There weren't many, and the ones that were seemed to add an extra 45 minutes. One hour to get home was one thing. Two hours to get home was ridiculous. I thought they usually give people a warning before they started construction. I remember thinking to myself that it was whatever, and I'd just used the GPS on my phone. It was around 9 at night when I left the hospital. I settled into my car, put my phone onto the bolted stand on the dashboard, and typed in my address. It automatically gave me a different route to take, already taking the roadwork into account. I clicked start, and off I went. The beginning of the route took me through a little town and a couple of well-off neighbourhoods. Seemed nice enough. I hadn't known it even existed. It wasn't on the map I was looking at when I was at work. Maybe it was just too small. At least that's what I told myself. Around a half an hour into the route, it started to become more rural and narrow. I loved a scenic view, hence why I moved to a rural place. It was a way too dark to appreciate the scenery though. The road narrowed so tight, it felt like a one way. If another car were to come speeding in the opposite direction, we collide indefinitely. I went slow, kept my lights on. Every 10 minutes, it felt like I was seeing the same thing. I felt like I was going in circles. It was so dark. No street lights or houses. Only trees leading into a cliff with a dainty guardrail as protection. The other side went uphill and led into extremely dense forest. That side didn't have a guardrail. I was laser focused on getting home. I didn't care how long it took me. Upon coming round a fairly sharp bend, I saw something scattering my peripheral vision. When I fully made the bend, I slowed down. I couldn't really see anything. So if it was an animal in the road, I was easily going to hit it. I drove for about five minutes before I saw a figure in the distance. I couldn't quite make out if it was a man or a woman, but I could tell they had the thumb out. They were hitchhiking, here. I hadn't seen a single car the entire time. When I started to get closer, I could tell it was a woman. She was young. She seemed maybe in her early twenties. Her head was down and her long blonde hair covered her face. She seemed lost. I know you should never really stop for a hitchhiker, for safety reasons, but this was just too weird. If she needed help, who knows when the next car would go by. My doctor senses kicked in. I pulled over and rolled down my window. Hello, miss. Are you in need of medical attention? I'm a doctor. My voice came out more concerning than I expected. No, thank you for stopping. Her voice was quiet. I could barely hear Yeah, no problem. Do you... Do you need help getting somewhere? Before I could even finish talking, she fled. She descended into the woods so fast it was like she vanished right in front of my eyes. The forest was so dense and dark, all it took was a quick sprint and she was completely out of my range of vision. Now, I tried to call the police. There was zero service, as you can imagine. I decided I would call them again when I got home. I wasn't stopping again, and I was freaked the hell out. I did manage to make it home three hours after I initially left. I tried to look up how long the roadworks would take, but I couldn't find anything online. Peeved, I emailed one of my co-workers if they could fill in for me for the next three days. I hadn't taken a day off since I started working there, and he was happy to oblige. I figured the roadwork would have been done by then, and I could actually have a few days to myself. After that, I made myself something quick to eat, got in the shower and went to bed. I had completely forgotten about my encounter with the woman. I was exhausted. I fell asleep thinking about all of the free time I was about to have. I was pretty excited. Around 2.15am, I was awoken by a scratching sound. It sounded like mice crawling all throughout the walls. The sound was sharp and deep. At first, I thought I was still sleeping and it was just a dream, then I heard a crash from the kitchen. I sat up immediately. When I bought my home, I also purchased a gun for protection. 
I never actually planned on using it and knew the bare minimum about owning a firearm. I only got it because I was going to be living alone. It made me feel safe and I kept it in a box underneath my bed. Well, this was the first time I had felt extremely uneasy. I quietly got out of bed and pulled the box out from underneath. I tried to load the gun as quickly and quietly as I could. Once it was done, I listened. No footsteps. No banging on crashing. Just silence. I made my way down the hall. My steps went down in a circular motion. It wasn't quite a spiral and it had a landing in the middle. Directly down my stairs, my kitchen was in direct front view. I had my phone's flashlight pointing off with one hand and the weapon in the other. Walking down the stairs felt dreadful, like walking down to get reprimanded by your parents but more sinister. I walked down slower, trying not to make any noise. When I got to the landing, I spun around and pointed my flashlight towards the kitchen. I couldn't see anything, so I went the whole way down. Upon walking to my kitchen, nothing seemed out of place. I walked around the island that sat in the middle of the kitchen and stepped onto something sharp. I shined my flashlight towards the ground. It was one of my grandmother's antique ceramic plates. I kept them locked in a glass cabinet and I never took them out. They were more for show than actual use. I flipped the light switch on. Tears filled my eyes as I made way to the closet that I kept the broom in. Upon walking up to the closet, something else caught my attention. My front porch light was on, which wouldn't have been weird if it wasn't motion activated. Someone, or something, would have had to physically come onto my porch to trigger this light. I checked my door. It was still locked. I looked out of my window for a few minutes, continuously looking behind me. After I felt like no one was outside, I grabbed the broom and flicked on every light on my way back to the kitchen. I swept up the broken pieces and threw them away, checked the rest of the house, and ended up sleeping on the couch with my gun on the coffee table. The next day went completely normal. I actually had time to paint, which I never got to do anymore. I caught up on some reading, did some cleaning, and basically just lounged around. It wasn't until after dinner I had remembered the weird night I had previously. It had completely slipped my mind, even though the gun was still in plain view. I haven't even thought about how the plate got out of the locked cabinet or why the porch light was on. It all came rushing back, along with the memory of the woman on the side of the road. I realised I had never called the police. I really had meant to. The memory of my weird night became drowned out of the thought of that woman. I wondered if she was okay. I remember thinking how I should have called the police. If something happened to her, I feel partially responsible. I decided it would be best to just let it go as I didn't want to deal with the police. I figured they would think I imagined it from working such long hours. That night, I went to bed like any other night. This time, I was awoken by a slight cry. In my half-asleep state, it almost sounded like distant sobbing. It got louder, and I was fully awoken when it turned into a scream. I sat up and looked at my phone, 2.15am. Weird. I know I heard a scream and I thought I heard crying. The air felt still. It was so quiet you could hear a needle drop. Then I heard it. I heard crying, like that of a grieving widow or the mourning of a loss of a child. It was a soft but gut-wrenching cry. It sounded like it was coming from either within the house or right outside. I went to grab the box under my bed before I remembered. I'd left the gun out. It was still on the table. Oh no, 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 I whispered. I sat on the floor and racked my brain on the next logical move. I grabbed my phone and turned on the flashlight. This time, I was much quieter and moved methodically. The crime became clear as I moved towards the steps. It sounded like it was coming from the front of the house. I finally made it to the living room and grabbed the gun. Now feeling much more confident, I made my way to the front door. I could see the porch light shining through the curtains. The crying was loud. I checked the door. It was still locked. Finally, I moved my curtains. It was the girl from the road. Her clothes were the same, but much more tattered. Her eyes were completely bloodshot. Tears were flowing from her eyes. A small stream of flood flowed from the side of her head. Her blonde hair was partly matted and blooded. She was smiling, but it didn't match the emotion in her eyes. She wasn't blinking. She wasn't even making any sort of motion she was crying. It was ear piercing. She was crying but she stood as still as a mannequin. She was so close to the window, 
her breath was creating condensation on the glass. I just stood there, staring at her. She lifted up a tape recorder and clicked a button. It let out an ear-piecing cry. It was pre-recorded. Horror washed over my body as I watched the tears continue to flow from her eyes as I heard the recorded cry. What the hell? I mumbled under my breath. I kept eye contact as I reached for my doorknob. As soon as I looked away to make sure the door was still locked, she fled. I watched her run down my front porch steps and into the woods that surrounded the right side of my house. I watched out of my window for maybe another hour, until I felt safe again. I returned to the living room and sat on the couch, replaying everything that had just happened over in my head, and I felt a shiver go down my spine. I knew her. Before I saw her on the road. Before that night. I just couldn't remember where and I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I called the police around 7 in the morning. I told them what had happened and surprisingly they believed me. I wasn't sure why they were being so understanding. They told me to keep my doors locked and they'd give me a call later that day. While I waited for their call, I couldn't get her face out of my brain. That's when it dawned on me. There was a lady who escaped the psychiatric unit of the hospital I worked at. I had come into contact with her multiple times as she had contracted an infection during an unfortunate miscarriage. The loss of her baby is what led to her committed to the psychiatric unit. I called the hospital and asked for her name. My co-worker seemed confused. Hey, are you okay? I heard the police came by your house this morning. They're out looking for her now. You're not hurt, are you? My co-worker sounded worried. Yeah, I'm fine. I, I think I saw her last night. Weird things have been going on. I don't know what to make of it. I think she's been in my house, but I can't be sure. Why do you sound so panicked? They found a note on her bed. She thinks you're responsible for the loss of a baby. I thought that's why you took those days off to stay safe until they found her. His voice now more confused than worried. No, I didn't know, no one told me. That doesn't even make any sense. I only treated her infection. I probably sounded frantic at this point. No one told you this. Even the police knew. You need to go stay with your parents or something, especially if she's been at your house. I'll cover you, just stay safe. I gotta go, call me soon. His voice was stern. Yeah, okay, thank you, I'll talk to you soon. I hung up the phone. I packed all of my things and went to load everything into my car. I called the police and told them I'd be leaving until she was caught. They recommended that was the safest course of action. I ended up selling the house and quitting my job. I relocated closer to my parents and found a job at the local hospital there. The police did finally catch her though. The last phone call I received about the situation was from the police. They found her inside of my house, inside the attic. She had scratched profanity into the floorboard and was found with a gun. My gun. She had replaced my gun with a fake. The bullets were fake too. She had found my house key under the front door mat. She supposedly found my house following the wooded area and once she saw my car, she knew she was headed in the right direction. They say if I would have stayed one more day, I probably wouldn't have made it. It's been years and I still can't bring myself to have another three-day weekend. First of all, I want to say a big thank you to everyone for the amazing support I've received for my channel, but a special thanks goes out to the following. Green Death, Matthew J. Bauer, Dakota's a Loser, Angie Miller, Amy Avenue, Dr. Grimm, Unmas Marauder, Cali Envy 70, Wolfie Z124 and M Reza Amlashe. Please check out my Instagram on how to get shout outs on future videos. Thank you. And don't forget to subscribe.